the three of us here are from Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions. We're here on behalf of uh, the Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment, uh, the Water Resources Management Division. So we're going to uh, talk, as you all know, we're going to talk to you today about uh, boil water advisories. And uh, so there's a whole day of activities and exercises. Uh, you each have an agenda sitting at your, uh, in front of you, I think. And it will let you know what we're doing. The day is a mixture of presentations, activities, I think what you just did is probably the most difficult activity of moving around the room. The rest are interactive, but we've put you in at different tables so that you can learn something from people who are different from you and to split you up a little bit. Uh, we're gonna go around the room and introduce each, each other, we're going to ourselves. And we'll start with us. My name's Tizia Pramsma. I'm a senior hydrogeologist at Wood. And uh, this is? My name's Rich Harvey. I'm a senior water resources engineer with Wood. My name is Nancy Griffiths. I'm an environmental planner with Wood. We've uh, tried to design it so there's something for everyone. Uh, out of all the presentations we've given, this one is the most um, government heavy. So uh, we hope you'll, you know, some of the exercises are really designed for the communities, but we hope you'll join in and give any input that you can to help improve uh, things as we go. So. We're, we're coming in here today for a reason. What is it? We're, we're going to be talking about boil water advisories, and that's a big part of it. We want to talk about it. So you're coming from a community or you're coming from a government position. This is a chance for everyone to be in the same room in person, which doesn't happen a lot anymore, just to have an open discussion about issues in your community, anything you might face, issues that you've had as a government uh, representative reaching out to communities. It's just a chance to talk and be open. So try to maintain that throughout the day. We'll have activities. We'll have chances to interact with people. We have different breaks. Any chance you can to reach out and chat is going to be uh, something you should embrace. So if we're thinking about boil water advisories. Most of us are familiar with them, but just in case you're not, it's, uh, it's going to be issued when there is a risk or known contamination of a drinking water system. And it's going to be coming from the service NL or the health officer and going to be directed towards the community that they should implement the boil water advisory. And just as a check-in, out of curiosity, how long would you need to boil water to make it safe? If it's five minutes, 30 seconds, does anyone feel like sharing how, how long it might take? Two minutes. One minute. Rolling boil, two minutes after. Okay, so we've got a couple answers. There's a, a bit of a myth around it, but in General practice, it's one minute rolling boil. So it's that rolling boil part that's important. You want to get that water turning over on itself and get the heat into the water. But uh, beyond that, it's not going to provide any more level of disinfection. It's going to be one minute. So it's something to remember. You do have to achieve that minute. If you don't, it's not going to be the right level of safety. And something that does get missed, and this sometimes comes from the community relaying information to the people in the community, or even maybe the message that's being uh, sent out to the community. It's not just drinking water. So here we have a little person, they're brushing their teeth. There's a message, and if you look through your little pamphlet, you'll see some messaging material there. Um, it's maybe a few pages in. They're, they're handouts that you would give to community members, and handouts that a municipal person or someone on town council could review themselves. And, the basics of a boil water advisory, why it should be implemented, what do you need to do. But a big thing to remember is remind residents that it's not just drinking water. If you're making ice cubes, that water should be boiled. If you're brushing your teeth, you should be boiling that water too. There's still opportunities for the person to be placed in a scenario of risk if they're just boiling water that they drink and forgetting about these other exposure pathways. So if you're not familiar with those little handouts, it's a good chance throughout the day, maybe just skim through them. 
They are on the government website as a source of information to give out to communities. All right, kind of have it up here again. So we've got the residence option. You've got this little reminder if you're making coffee, if you're doing ice cubes, if you're brushing your teeth. You want to get that message out to the residents in the community just to keep people safe. The municipal official pamphlet looks pretty similar, but it does have a little bit of uh, different information. There's some messaging material there you'd want to review. And there's an important uh, piece of information here that we kind of visit on a few times today. But if it's a long-term boil water advisory, that continuous reminder to communities every month, check in with the residents, make sure they know the boil water advisory is still in place. You don't get to just tell them once and forget about it if the BWA stays in place. So that's just a bit of messaging material. But when we think about the boil water advisory, it's going to be issued when there's a known risk or potential for risk. But most of our boil water advisories in the province right now aren't going to be issued because there was some observed immediate threat in, say, the source water. There's a list of codes in your pamphlet there called the BWA Overview. And the way we categorize our boil water advisories in the province, we have these 18 different types of, or actually it might even be more than that, there's, there's different coding depending on the type of boil water advisory that was issued for a community. So the very first one you'll see at the top, it says A. So that's a boil water advisory issued to a community when they don't have a, a system to treat the water. So they have to be on a boil water advisory because you can't just give water to residents without any form of treatment. And there's other forms throughout there that'll show you the various kinds of boil water advisory a community could be put under. Here in the province, a big portion of our boil water advisories are the result of E1 or E2, and that's kind of the scenario when the water's out in the system and maybe it's not achieving the right amount of disinfection. So there's some technical things going on there. We have some issues with our, our Ds, they're the distribution system type things. Maybe there's some more infrastructure problems. There's some issues with equipment sometimes. There are things that just come up as part of running a water system. You have various assets, various types of equipment. They're going to fail at different times. There's a, a risk when that failure happens. So a boil water advisory gets issued. It's a lot of traditional kind of common things for a boil or a water system. Excuse me. There are some scenarios where you do have some microbiological threats. They're sort of a small portion. If we were to look at all of Canada, and boil water advisories are not just in Newfoundland, they're in Ontario, they're in BC, they're, they're throughout the country. Most all are the result of just an issue with equipment and process. So we're very similar to the rest of the country in some ways. Our boil waters are largely the result of just an issue with equipment or an issue with a process that has to be adjusted and accommodate it. There are some times when you have microbiological problems, some water quality problems due to E. coli. We'll get into a little bit of that this morning, but that's a small part. What is a bit different in the province, when we have this large portion that's related to equipment and sort of typical properties of running a water system, Many of our boil water advisories have been in place for more than five years. So they're long-term boil water advisories. So something came up in the system, it maybe wasn't addressed right away, and it lingered, and then there's time passes, and then all of a sudden, there's a significant amount of time that passes, and we're years into a boil water problem. So long that in many communities, they even forget they're on a boil water advisory, or they don't know why they were on a boil water advisory, because it's been so long. It's 15 years, it's 10 years. You don't remember. So that's kind of where we're coming today. We're trying to refresh and review and see if you're in a community that has had a long-term boil water advisory, how do you get back to a point of reviewing why you have one, finding a path to a solution, or if you're a community that has just had a scenario where something failed and you want to find a solution to it, try to avoid the chance of falling into this larger group of really long-term lingering boil water advisories. Part of the problem, and we all know it's a problem in Newfoundland, we have a lot of small communities. And our small communities, if we compare it to the rest of the country, the rest of the country comes in at a baseline saying, small community problems, there's 10,000 residents in the community. That's nothing like our small community. Our small communities are less than 100 people, 
50 people, a few families. So when you consider that scenario of a small group of people, they're going to have their own set of unique problems. So in Newfoundland, we kind of have to come up with some of our own unique approaches to the solution. We can embrace things in the rest of the country, but we've done a lot of things here, and the Municipal Affairs and Environment Group and Service NL have come up with a lot of interesting ways of dealing with our own local issues. And they're innovative, and we want to talk about them today. So if we're in this world of small communities, we know there's going to be a lot of problems, and we're going to take some time now. Nancy's going to walk you through an exercise where we're going to explore those problems a little bit. You're probably going to remember me as a person who made you do silly things, but uh, it's not, I won't get, to get too silly, and uh, I'm accustomed to be re being remembered for this kind of stuff. Uh, you all have on your table some colorful sticky notes, and I'm sure you're familiar with sticky notes, and if you're not, Dorothea there can, can help. <laughs> I just caught her doing that. Um, we're all familiar with these, we use them all the time, but we're going to use them in a little different way. We're going to use them to perform uh, some analysis. So uh, what we want you to do is to take a little time. How much time, Rich, we give them? Let's just do five minutes to start. Okay. We're going to write some things down. We're going to collect them and group them, and then we're going to have a discussion. So what we'd like you to do is uh, this makes the most sense if you're from a municipality, so we'll kind of do it in two parts. If you're from a community, uh, please write down what the issues uh, you have with your drinking water system. And if you're not from a community, if you're involved in regional government or provincial, uh, you can write down things that you've observed based on communities that you've worked with or people that you've talked to who are uh, operating municipal drinking water systems. So write them on the, st on the sticky notes and... Uh, We'll get back to you in a little bit. But when we're thinking about these problems, so you just wrote down, some of you wrote down a lot. So we're probably going to see a lot of things in a little bit, a lot of different problems, all over the place probably. But what is it about some communities that have great systems? And there's probably a number in your head that you know of, where you're thinking if you're a small community, I wish we had water like these people. Or why don't we have better water? What is it about us and our current situation that we can't be off of boil water advisory? So if we're thinking about that, good systems usually have a lot of capacity. And if capacity, if you never heard the phrase before in this context, it's the ability or the power to understand a problem and do something. And that's a big part of what, why we're here today. We want to work on capacity building. And there's different kinds of capacity. So typically, when we think about our problems with water, and it's a tendency for a lot of us, we just focus on technical things. My water's bad because the pipes break. It's just a focus on a technical thing. It's the easiest thing to sort of pick apart. There's various kinds of technical capacity. So there are, there's stuff like the physical infrastructure, the pipes and the pumps and various parts of your system as it goes out into the community. A big part of it, though, is also the knowledge and the ability of the personnel you rely on. So do they have the built-up capacity, that knowledge about problems, the ability to act on problems that can help them overcome those problems? So if you are in a community with a high level of capacity, a question like this would be, of course I know how much water our community uses on an average day. There are a lot of communities, and we've met them throughout the course of the workshops, who know they have problems with their system, but one of the foundational parts of the system, how much water is actually going out into the community, how much water is being pumped, how much water is being treated, they don't know. So as a starting point, there's a gap in the knowledge that you'd want to work on. If you didn't know the answer to that question, that's where you'd want to be trying to pursue an answer and try to build up your capacity. If you move away from technical problems, there's managerial capacity. That's coming down to the staff, the leaders in the community, their ability to organize, collect information, delegate,
get the right people working on the right tasks. And it's also their ability to maintain a linkage with the outside world. So beyond the walls of the community, do you have the right connections to the person in government who will help you find a solution to a problem, the right supplier of equipment who's going to give you the right pricing, the right response in the right amount of time. There are a lot of communities who have kind of internalized all their problems that they've had in a water system over years. Maybe a single operator has only dealt with the problems in that system. And over a long period of time, they just keep all that information to themselves. They lose all the linkages. They don't contact ServiceNL anymore. They've forgotten they're supposed to. They don't know that they could reach out to Deneen Spracklin's group for guidance. And that's what we've been trying to build in the workshops, those opportunities for them to say, oh yeah, there is a support system out there. I've got to go maintain it as a community leader. So if you had a lot of capacity, again, a question like that would be, of course, I know who to contact to get my water quality data. That's an easy thing. I'm going to go on the website that the government provides. I'm going to be able to talk to people about what I see, if there's anything that seems to be of concern. It's not going to be a problem for me to understand the data that's been collected about my system. At the manager level, too, not just the technical operator. You want to have management involved as well. So we've had technical capacity. There's managerial capacity. And when you're looking at financial capacity, and that's a big thing for a lot of small communities, there's an opportunity that they will have to build their financial capacity, which is the ability to go out and get money when you need it and manage the money that you have. So a community with the right level of capacity in the financial world, they're going to have an annual water budget. So they took time and they looked at how much money do we spend on chemicals in, the, in a regular year? How much money do we have to pay people to come in and clean different kinds of equipment? They've got it all broken down and they know how much money they're spending. There are a lot of communities now with part of their community tax reporting. They do have a water budget and they have worked through this, which is great and it's a good first step. But they still don't always interpret the information that they've collected to think, is that right for our situation right now? Do we have to get better? So given that we've got these three groups, we've got technical, capacity, managerial, and financial, Nancy's going to walk through a bit of the next organizational task. On these uh, flip charts here, I'm going to write each of those titles of the types of capacity, and we're going to ask you to sort your issues by type. So that's our little ana bit of analysis on it. So right, right off the bat, one thing that we can tell is that most of the issues are likely to be technical, as Rich was t addressing that, um, but a fair number in, in managerial and, and financial, less so. But financial probably goes through, it goes across the board as well, we know that. There's probably no, no problem money couldn't fix, right? <laughs> Enough of it. So what we'd like to do now, and you guys can pitch in as well, We'd like to, we can't go through all of these, but we'd like to have a little discussion with you, a back and forth um, about the things you wrote here, and we may question certain ones that we think are interesting or we didn't understand uh, what you meant. ...for the community to maintain the capacity to still keep doing things, because there is a, a tendency in a lot of communities if I had a million dollars, I'd get new equipment and everything would be good. And then that's the approach that for a long time, most communities in the country have taken to dealing with water issues. I'll put money into the system, we'll get new technical infrastructure, everything will be fine. When in reality, and we can kind of see that now, and probably a few of you had that hesitancy of where do I stick this, because this really is somewhere in the middle of all three. You have to build capacity in every area in a community. You can't be really, really strong technically and not have the management who's recognizing our operator is going to retire soon and no one else is available to step up as a volunteer. 
if that manager wasn't taking a chance to go out and talk to people in the community to say it's important that we have an operator because this person's leaving and we want clean water, if they're not doing that technical, that's only going to be good for so long. Eventually you're going to be back in a boil water advisory. Same with the financial. If you get a big investment in the community and then don't have a means of paying for it and maintaining it, before long you're back to square one. So the boil water advisory reduction initiative is around to help build the technical side and also to build these other managerial financial sides, giving the communities the whole set of tools they need to actually find a solution, not just focusing in on the technical, which we tend to do. And maybe if there's things that came up in discussion or if they're coming up throughout the course of the day, if you're thinking, oh yeah, I didn't think about the managerial side, <clears throat> feel free to add a sticky note to the board. The more that you can acknowledge that there's other kinds of problems, the more you'll find the, the right solution for the community. And we do tend to dwell. So we look at all of our problems, and there might be a lot. Some communities do seem to have a lot of things up against them. But for the most part, every community has something that's unique or special or it's a strength. And that's something that it's good to acknowledge. And this may be for the government representatives, if you reflect on your own experiences working with certain communities that seem to be doing the right thing. What was it about that community? What was their strength? If you wanted to offer up that, that could be quite helpful. So maybe we'll just take a minute or two just to try to think, what's good about my community? What is it that I'm going to be able to leverage when I'm looking to build capacity in those areas? If you want to take a a sticky note just for a few minutes. If you can't come up with something, then maybe that's a problem. Maybe you need to look back on the community and think about, well, how do I make things better? Well, let's just do that for a few minutes, if you would.